Good morning. Happy Labor Day weekend. Even though school started a couple weeks ago, this always seems like, you know, the summer's gone, fall is upon us. I won't talk about that white stuff that might be coming. <laughs> well, if my name is Pastor Daryl, and it's an honor to be here to share the word with you this morning. I'm going to welcome you here, those who are in the family venue, the chapel, or watching online. Thanks for being with us today. This morning, we get to look at Psalm 89. So if you would take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 89. Over the years, God has blessed me to work in, a, in, in churches, and I've also worked at a funeral home, and it's, there is a stark difference between families who know their Lord as Savior and families who do not know Jesus during times of suffering and of loss. There is a, a hope that you can, and a peace that cannot be described by words to those families going through difficult times, even though they are struggling immensely at the loss of a loved one. I remember in August of 2011, it was a weeknight, it was about nine o'clock at night. I was laying on the couch reading, just about getting ready to go to bed, and my phone rings. And it's uh, one of the, I was a lead pastor at a church in Rockford area. And I almost didn't answer, but I said, no, I'm going to answer this. And the first words that come out of Jim's mouth was, Kyle is dead. This was his 19-year-old son who had been taken in a car accident. They just, the police were at the house and they were hurting, went to the home and they grieved immensely and still to this day struggle with the loss of their son. But I can tell you this, they also had a foundation of God and his sovereignty and his goodness and his steadfast love and his faithfulness. So in their time of great grief and suffering, there was also this contradiction, so to speak, of, of faith and rejoicing in who God is and for eternity and the blessed hope that we have. And this morning as we come to Psalm 89, we're going to see that, that same thing. We're going to see great praise and adoration for God and, and his steadfast love and his faithfulness. Then we're going to see questions like, how long, O Lord, and remember, Lord, because of the great suffering that is going on. In this psalm, Psalm 89, it's, it's written by a man named Ethan, the Ezraite, and we don't know exactly when in history he wrote this, of, of Israel, but we do know things are bad during this time. It, this could be during the time of the split of the king. Remember after Solomon, there was son Rehoboam, and then there was a guy named Jeroboam, he rose up, and then the, the kingdom of Israel split into the north and the south. It could be during that time, a, a troubled time. It could be during the time when in the southern kingdom, there was a woman named Athaliah who claimed who took the throne to be queen and was killing off all of David's bloodline. But her sister hid a grandchild named Joash who then became king. It could be during that time. It could be during the exile when Babylon overthrew Judah. We do not know. But we, what we do know is Ethan has seen God's people Israel and seen David rise up to the throne. He's seen good time. They see, he's seen God's covenant with David and God being faithful to that. And Israel into prosperity, but then also a fall into sin. And now some very difficult times. And that is the setting of this of this psalm that as Ethan the Ezraite writes for us. Let's look a little bit. We're look at verses one through three. There's, there's 52 verses in this psalm, and no, I'm not gonna be able to touch on every verse. But we'll look, at, we'll look at many of them and get an overview of what this is. Let's look at one and three, then 38 through 45, and let's see the contrast of this psalm. Verse one, a mascal of Ethan the Ezraite. I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I said steadfast love will be built up forever. In the heavens you will establish your faithfulness. You have said I have made a covenant 
with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. Selah. Then coming down to verse 38. But now you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant and you have defiled his crown in the dust. You return man to, oh, you have breached all his walls. You have laid his strongholds in ruins. All who pass by plunder him. He, he has become a scorn of his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his foes. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and you have made him not stand in battle. So you see there are these, this contrasting and, and we're gonna look at today, the main point of this is this here. The difficult circumstances of life do not change the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And Lord, we, we praise you for how great you are. Lord, we thank you so much that we can hide in you, that you are our rock, our foundation. Lord, we thank you for the cross in Christ, that we have salvation. Lord, may we cling to that always. Lord, as we open your word this morning, be with me that I would speak your truth. Lord, help us to hear your word. Spirit, move amongst us and change us for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First, I wanna look at this. Our foundation is God's steadfast love and faithfulness. Our foundation is God's steadfast love and faithfulness. This psalm starts out, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. God's steadfast love and faithfulness is eternal, and we must keep that eternal mindset. Have you ever sat back and thought about how long eternity actually is? You know, we sing in that the hymn Amazing Grace, the last verse. Gotta love the last verse, right? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. When John Newton wrote that, 10,000 was a big number, and it still is a slightly large number. But today, in the 21st century, we may say it more like this. When we've been there 10 billion years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing his praise than when we'd first begun. See, eternity is hard to comprehend. Why? Because we only know that which has a beginning and that which has an end. We are born and we die. We get things that, you know, a season begins, a season ends. We have that in our lives. But God is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. Try to wrap your mind around that. He is eternal. And his steadfast love is eternal. His faithfulness is eternal. I love this when you say this. If we have put our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our reality now and for eternity is to experience, sing about, and proclaim the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. That is our reality. But we get caught up in the immediate. We get caught up in seeking our own kingdom rather than the kingdom of God. We want that instant gratification. And we should be thankful for things that we can get quickly. Pastor Aaron spoke a couple weeks ago about prime shipping and Amazon. And I, I, I'm right there with him. You know, I get very, very happy when I, there's something I want. And it's like, It'll be here tomorrow. But have you ever had it when it says it'll be here tomorrow and then all of a sudden you get the email that says, there's something wrong with your order. It will not come tomorrow. Anyone have that before? And I get angry because I want something instantly. I want something now. And we get caught up in all of that rather than resting in the, the eternal mindset that we should have we can get caught up in what is going on in our life and some of the struggles and forget about the eternal mindset that we should have, that God's steadfast love is eternal. And it says here in the next verse that, with my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. 
parents, grandparents, how much do we think about and talk about God's steadfast love and faithfulness with our children or grandchildren? I remember a story my parents told me when I was just a little kid, and I still remember them telling it to me, and it has made an impact on my whole life. There was one point in their early marriage, I, I wasn't born yet, I had some brothers who were born where they, they had no money. My dad was going to, to seminary, and he was a janitor, and they had no money. And yet they said, we still gave faithfully. And they didn't have any groceries in the house, and they didn't know how they were going to feed the kids. And they come home, and someone had put four bags of groceries outside of their door. God's steadfast love and faithfulness, taking care of his people in a simple way, feeding them. I remember that. I don't remember how old, but that has stuck with me my whole life. Are we proclaiming God's steadfast love and faithfulness to all generations, speaking it? Or are we more interested in, in talking to our kids about sports and school and all those things, which are good, but working in God's goodness and faithfulness into that? We need to have an eternal perspective. And when we have that eternal perspective, it puts everything else in proper perspective. Young people in the house, do you think it is important to know about God and his steadfast love and his faithfulness? It is very important. Do you proclaim it? It is the most important thing to know. It is the bedrock of our lives and how we will function in good and bad times. As Ethan continues on, he, he continues on talking about how God and his steadfast love and faithfulness is all powerful. This is how God can carry out all that he does because nothing can be compared with him. Look at verse five. It says, let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies can be compared with, to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings is like the Lord, a God greatly to be feared in the counsel of the holy ones and awesome above all who are around him? O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. You rule the raging of the sea. When the waves rise, you still them. You crush Rahab like a carcass. You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. The heavens are yours. The earth also is yours. The world and all that is in it, you have founded them. The north and the south, you have created them. Tabor and Hermon, joyously praise your name. You have a mighty arm, strong as your hand, high your right hand. God is in control of all things. Do any of you struggle? I know I do when I have plans and things that I plan go awry and I lose control and I don't know quite what to do. When we feel like we've lost control of what is going on in our lives, we get angry, we worry, we become anxious about everything, we, we come short with our family members, and because that is a bad feeling, but God has it in control. He knows. It's funny to think about and to realize that that feeling of loss of control and then anxiety that it brings, God has never experienced that. You know why? Because he made all things. He is powerful above all things. He is control and of all things. And all of creation proceeds from and belongs to God. All of creation and all of history from the time God said, let there be light to Jesus saying, it is finished until we hear the last trumpet at Jesus' second coming has been designed and carried out by God. It says the heavens are his, all the heavenly host. Nothing can be compared to God. He is awesome above all who are around him. It talks about that he is a, he's powerful. He rules the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. With a mighty arm, you scatter your enemies. Think about that. The Lake Michigan, I was there a couple weeks ago, and there were some pretty big waves. And I was there with the grandkids, and I had uh, Calvin, a one and a half year old, and Quincy, two and a half year old, with me. And we were just sitting in the shallow water because you, know, you don't take little kids that size out when the waves are, are smashing. They're pretty big. 
And we were just sitting there and I was holding them and one came big enough that I was sitting there and knocked me over and then the undertow went out and I had to grab Quincy and pull her back because it was taking her out. It's powerful. You feel that power when you're out there or when you go out and you're there, all your, your chairs and everything are right there and you look back five minutes later and you're way down this way or way down the other way because you're being towed all around. And that's just a smidgen of the power. The raging sea can take down big tankers and huge boats. But God is over that. We've seen in, in Jesus when he was on this earth, God in the flesh, when he was in a boat and the storm was raging and the disciples thought he, they, they were going to die, he said, peace be still. And the storm and the, and the raging of the sea stopped. He is over all the earth, says, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all that is in it. You have founded them. We can have faith that God carries out his steadfast love and faithfulness because he is in control of all things. I love verse 14 too. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your faith. face. So we see that God, he rules. The foundation of his throne is righteousness and justice. That's who he is. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before him. And there's great blessing with walking and walking with God. And we have that foundation in our lives that cannot be taken away from us. Moving on also, we can see that God keeps his covenant promises. Verse 3 says this, You have said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant. I will establish your offspring forever and build your throne for all generations. And skip down with me to verse 20, where it says this, I have found David, my servant, with my holy oil. I have anointed him so that my hand shall be established with him. My arm shall also shall strengthen him. You think of David. You know, he is this shepherd boy, and God chooses to work through him. Think of how many men at that time in Israel tended the flocks like David did, had lived and died, and we know nothing about them. David, it wasn't David that made him special. It was the favor of the Lord that shined upon him. And remember the, in 1 Samuel, God gives instructions to, to Samuel. God had rejected Saul the king. He says, go to Jesse in the city of Bethlehem. And from there, I'm going to bring forth the next king. So Samuel goes down. All the sons that are there line up. And there's the son Eliab, and he's, he's impressive. God says to Samuel, says this, but this is 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then he gets through the rest of the sons, and he, God doesn't say that this, the right son is there. And he goes, you have any other sons? He's like, oh yeah, there's David. He's out tending the flocks. David was not even important enough to be there. But they called David. Samuel, God says this is the one Samuel anoints him. God was with David, protected him, even though Saul wanted to kill him at times, and brings him to the throne. And God makes a covenant promise with David. And we see this in 28 and 29 of Psalm 89, it says, my steadfast love I will keep for him forever and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring and his throne as the days of the heavens. This is repeating 2 Samuel 7 where the prophet Nathan comes to David and says, David wants to build a temple. God says, no, your son is going to do it, but from him, Solomon, I'm going to establish your throne forever. There will be someone who will come and rule as king forever. And now we know who this is, right? It's Jesus coming down the line. But Ethan has seen this covenant promise that God has made and how God brought David and established him. Do you ever sit back and marvel how God can make these promises? 
and he can keep them over centuries that go by, millions of people coming and going, different rulers rising up and dying off. Yet it never slows down. It never comes in the way of God's promises that he makes to his people. That is some amazing power. We can make plans for something and then something out of our control, like we get a bacteria in our body and, and we get a cold or the flu and it's small. We can't even see it. And it, it, we're in our beds. We're sick. It changes everything. Or we get a flat tire. We cannot control much, but God makes promises and brings them about, and nobody or nothing can stop him. Let's go down to verse 34 and look at how God has been faithful to his covenant with David. Verse 34 through 37. So I will not violate my covenant or alter the word that went forth from my lips. Once for all I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever. His throne as long as the sun before me, like the moon it shall be established forever, a faithful witness in the skies. So we see David has become king. His family line has been on the throne. There's been great prosperity, and now there's trouble. We're going, and this brings us to the lament part of this psalm. One thing we need to understand, this lament portion of the psalm None of the author's lament changes the truth of God's steadfast love, faithfulness, or power. We lament in light of that. Lots of times we look at it as an either or. We either believe God is all powerful and we're, we're rejoicing in him or everything is going bad and we're, we're just, we don't know if we can trust things anymore. No, it's a both and. We can sit there and we can say, I will sing of the steadfast love of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known his faithfulness to all generations. And we can lament and say, Lord, how long is this going to last? Are, are you just going to let your servants be mocked? In the same psalm we have that. And we can, in our own lives, we can have that same thing. We can be blessing the Lord with our mouth and lamenting Lord to the Lord at how bad things are. So when life is difficult, don't forget. We tend to get caught up in the immediate and we forget. It seems like the, th the throne of David is in shambles. And verse 38 says, you have cast off and rejected. You are full of wrath against your anointed. You have renounced the covenant with your servant. You have defiled his crown to dust. It even seems it's so bad. It seems that God has renounced the covenant. That's how bad it is. He hasn't, and we know he hasn't. David's throne is being plundered by those who hate God. And he even asks, how long, O Lord? Verse 46, how long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity you have created all the children of man? What man can live and never see death? Who can deliver his soul from the power of Sheol? Ethan cannot see what God is doing at this time. He's lamenting based on the promises of God. He's saying, Lord, I know this is true about you. How long is this going to last? I want to see your goodness again. My life is short. In my lifetime, Lord, I want to see your covenant faithfulness again. Because Ethan's faith in God does not negate how difficult the situation is. We must remember that hard times in the sinful world will come, but our faith gives us hope. And he knows his life is short. And he asks God to remember. Verses 49 through 51 says this, Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked, and how I bear in my heart the insults of the, all the many nations with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. Verse 52, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. David is, Ethan is calling for God to go into action against those who mock his people, who mock his anointed one. Remember your covenant and go into action 
We can think that as well when, when God's name is mocked, when the name of Jesus is mocked today. Lord, remember the new covenant. Remember, Lord, that we are your people. And we can also call upon the promises of God during tough times. In Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, it says this, For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Or Romans 8, 31, If God is for us, who can be against us? 1 John 4, 4, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And we can, even in our lament, we can say, just like Ethan does at the end, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Closing here. In troubled times, remember the steadfast love and faithfulness of God. We have seen God's promises more than Ethan had at this time. David, the covenant made with David in 2 Samuel, we've seen it play out in a much greater way. You look in Matthew chapter one, it's a, it's a family tree, it's a genealogy. Where do, where do Mary and Joseph go? When they, when they have to go to the census, they go to Bethlehem, the city of David. Why? Because Joseph is of the line of David. Because here comes the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus, the fulfillment of the one who will reign on the throne, David's heir who will come and rule for eternity. And he came and he lived a perfect life, fulfilling the law on our behalf. He died on the cross, taking our sins, taking the penalty we deserved, and he rose again the third day, doing away with sin and death, conquering them. And yet we wait. And yet we wait. And things, evil men rise Bad times come, we lose loved ones, and we wait for the promise of God to be fulfilled again. But we do that with hope. In troubled times, we need to remember the power of God. I love this. Heidelberg Catechism, Lord Day One. Some of you may remember this. Some of you may have PTSD from trying to memorize this back in the day. But I love what it says. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and, and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen? Amen. We remember the power of God in difficult times and that he has us in the palm of his hand and it's okay even though it's really hard. His steadfast love and faithfulness still endure in troubled times, remember the power of God. In troubled times, remember the power of God. I love these verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, which says this. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that may not grieve as others, that you may not grieve as others who do not have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we declare to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, the voice of the archangel with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds of the air to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We remember the promises of God. 
He's coming again. We will be with him for eternity. And that is true. When we go through tough times, we look forward to that hope that one day God is going to bring justice and righteousness forever to the, in the new heavens and new earth. And we wait. But we wait in eager expectation. And another thing that we do as we wait, as we're commanded by our Lord Jesus, is we partake in the Lord's table and we remember what Jesus has done for us in fulfilling his promises and coming. We remember his body broken. We remember the blood shed for us. And we also look forward to the day when Jesus will come again and we will eat with him for, and be with him for eternity. This morning we get to partake in that. And I just encourage you to remember and be thankful and be joyful that we have a great God whose steadfast love and his faithfulness will be here for eternity. Let's pray. Lord, come to you this morning and praise you for your steadfast love and faithfulness. Lord, thank you that you have made promises and we can see the history of how you've kept your promises and we have seen them work out in history, Lord, and we have faith that one day you are going to return for us. We thank you for Jesus and his shed blood and his resurrection. Lord, I pray for people who are here today going through dark times, Lord. Help them to have peace and help them to rest in your goodness, your faithfulness, your love, and your promises, Lord, knowing that, that we, we can grieve, but we grieve with hope. Lord, I just pray as we, we take of your table, Lord, that we would remember how good you are in your salvation. Lord, you're awesome and good God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.